sure how I can follow the cuteness that we just witnessed, but I'm not even going to try to do that. Uh, this morning we're going to start with our scripture lesson this morning, so it's going to be in Matthew 28, uh, verses 16 through 20. I think it'll be behind me, although I never really know about that. Um, 16 through 20, so to set up the passage a little bit, uh, Jesus is communicating with his disciples. It's his final communication with them in Matthew. And we know it as the Great Commission, and they're meeting uh, on a mountain. So we'll pick up in verse 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. As I read this passage, it's amazing to me how much trust Jesus had in these 11 guys. There were 12, of course, and we know that, and one had already uh, gone off in a different direction. But in these 11 guys, Jesus hung the plan of salvation for us and for those that came before us and for those that will come after us. The plan of salvation was squarely placed on the shoulders of these 11 men when he asked them to go and make disciples. And it's amazing to me because we see right here in the text that even at that time, some of them doubted. Wow. Some of them doubted after being with Jesus for three years, following him, learning from him, seeing all the miracles that he had done, seeing him crucified on the cross, buried, and then being resurrected. And even at that point, some of them doubted. And yet Jesus had faith in these 11 men to carry forth his word and the gospel to others. Who were they? Well, they were selfish. They were prideful. They lacked faith. Jesus says himself that they were dull and foolish. And I want to draw that out this morning because we're going to be talking about what it means to be a disciple and to make disciples and sometimes when we talk about these sorts of concepts and this topic in a church, some of us might begin to feel insecure. Some of us might begin to feel like, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm not that kind of person. But when we see these people that Jesus put his faith in to do that, I can identify with a lot of those characteristics that they had of feeling insecure sometimes, feeling like, well, I don't know if I can do that, feeling selfish. But it's an important topic for us this morning. And it's not only important to me and my life, it's important to the United Methodist Church. This is one of about 1,200 churches in the West Ohio Conference. And there's a mission statement that the Methodist Church has in this conference. And the mission statement says simply, making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And so our mission as a church and as individuals is to make disciples. Well, what is a disciple? That's the first question, and the question that we're mostly going to spend our time on this morning. What is a disciple? And I want you to take just a moment and think about how you would respond to that question if someone were to ask you, what is a disciple? It's not necessarily an easy question because it's easier to look at things that does not make us a disciple. Coming to church does not make you a disciple. A person can come to church every week and not be a disciple. Reading the Bible does not make someone a disciple. Teaching the Bible does not make someone a disciple. You could be a pastor, a missionary, and still not be a disciple. So what does this word mean, disciple? A disciple is more about what we've submitted ourselves to and what we've surrendered in our life. And so when Jesus says to these 11 guys, go and make disciples, they hear it in the Greek, and the Greek literally means learner. Go and make learners. And so they have an image in their mind of what a learner is. 
just as we do. But our image is probably different than theirs. Our image probably looks like a student in a classroom with other, other students around them and a whiteboard or a smart board nowadays and a teacher. Their picture and their image would have been much different. Their image would have been a teacher or a master who had invited people to come with him and to learn from him. And so that's what we saw Jesus do in the beginning of the Gospels. He called those 12 to him, to be with him and to learn from him. And that call to follow and to be with was unconditional. And it required that the learner, the student, submit themselves totally to what the master was teaching and what the master was trying to accomplish with them. It required that they leave their homes and they leave everything that they know, and they go and be with that master all the time. Just over a week ago, I was in the office of a pastor in a small town not far from here. And the pastor had been working with uh, the ministry that I am now with and have been with for a while, the Navigators. And what we do is we help churches and pastors in the area of discipleship. And we want to create a culture of discipleship in churches. So it's a part of the DNA of their church. And so this pastor was about, he's 62 years old. And he had been working with us for about the past four months. And as I sat with him and we talked together, he just shared how amazing it has been for him and his church to understand at a greater depth what it means to be a disciple and what it means to make disciples. And we'll call him Bill. His name's not Bill, but we'll call him that. And Bill said to me, he said, Justin, I am so transformed by this that I want you to know I am committed to making disciples as long as I have breath. In a previous conversation, he communicated that he wished he'd had delved into these topics decades before. But that's significant to me in that he says now, at 62 years old, he's not thinking until retirement. He's thinking as long as he is here on earth, he just wants to be committed to making disciples. Again, I recognize this can be an un uncomfortable concept for us or topic for us. And to be honest with you, as I prepared this message this morning, Jesus put his finger on a place in my life and said, Justin, what about this right here? If you're following me, what about that? And it's uncomfortable for me. But I would ask us that we open our hearts and, and look at what the Bible has to say about being a disciple. And this morning, we're going to look at three marks of a disciple, and there are more than three. But we're going to look at three, and I'm going to communicate about them as questions. And so the three are, uh, am I continually following? Am I continually learning? Am I continually bearing fruit? Before we go further, let's just take a moment and pray that God would bless our time together. Lord, we thank you that you are here among us. God, you say that where two or three or more come together in your name, that you are here. Lord, we thank you that we know that and have that assurance. God, I ask that you would help us to open our hearts or that we would not shrink back from the things that you might be trying to communicate. Lord, but that we would lean in and that, that we would be willing to question and look at our own lives and the things that the Holy Spirit is, is bringing up to us in these moments. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Am I following? When I was a boy, I played basketball, and I was no Le LeBron James, obviously, or I would probably be in the NBA at this point. But one of my strengths as a player was defense. And I remember a game in particular. I was about 8 or 10 years old. And our team was close, but the other team was starting to pull away. And the reason was there was this one guy that was starting to make all the baskets, and we didn't have an answer. And I remember the coach calling a timeout and bringing us in together. And the coach looked at me and he said, Justin, can you guard this guy? I said, yep. I don't, I don't remember if I was before or not. But anyway, I said, yeah, I can do that. And he said, okay, I want you to stay with him wherever he goes. And then my coach said something to me that has stuck with me about following. He said to me, Justin, if he goes to get a drink, I want you to be there to wipe his mouth. If he goes to the bathroom, you'd be there to pull his pants up for him. That's kind of a funny way to talk about guarding a guy in basketball, but it stuck with me, and I got the point about following this guy. I needed to be so close to him that whatever he was doing, I was right there. And I wish I remember the rest of the game and the rest of the story, but I don't. So 
in my mind this week, I was imagining that I shut the guy down and he didn't score any other points, but I don't really know if that's true. But about following, Jesus asks us to follow like that. He doesn't ask us to follow just well enough that we can see him somewhere in the distance and kind of take a step or two. He asks us to follow him closely. Last week, I referenced a chicken and a pig that were walking along and decided they were going to help with breakfast, and the chicken wanted to bring eggs, and the chicken suggested that the pig bring ham, and the pig didn't like that idea because it required a full commitment. But that's the kind of commitment that Jesus calls for when he asks us to follow him, a full commitment that we would bring the ham. Some people in our society today say that they are not religious. I don't agree with that, and I don't agree with that because of what theologian Paul Tillich talked about in one of his, his books, where he said everyone in the world is religious. And he defined religion this way. Religion is what you're ultimately most concerned about. And so what are you most concerned about? What is the thing that you continue to think about and dwell on in your thought life? What do you give yourself to? Because when Jesus asks us to be a disciple and to follow him, he's asking us to submit ourselves to his agenda as the master. That following him becomes not only our greatest passion, but our hobby as well. Follow me is a constant refrain in the gospel. It's the first, things he's, first thing he said to Peter, and it's the last thing he said to Peter. Follow me. Follow me. But it's not an easy thing, and it's not something that we should go into lightly. In Luke 9, 23 and 24, Jesus says it like this. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. Following Jesus requires us to submit and surrender our life to him, that we are willing to lose it. And in return, God gives us and Jesus gives us a new life of following him. Following also presupposes movement. We don't say things like, I am following a rock right now. We don't say, you know, I'm following the grass lately. We might say something like, you know, I follow the Reds. I follow Spartan football. We say things in regard to following. We say things about things that are in motion or developing. And Jesus is moving. Jesus is moving even today in our world, in our lives, in the lives of our neighbors. And some of them recognize that and some of them don't. But he is moving and he is at work. Am I following the way that Jesus defines following? Have I submitted myself to him? Number two, am I learning? When I was a junior at Miami University up the road here, I went to a Bible study for the first time from, it was uh, part of the Navigators, and I didn't know anything about the Navigators at the time, but I knew Bible studies, and I'd been to Bible studies, and my whole life, from the time I was born to the time I was 18, I'd been in church and, on Sundays and considered myself a pretty good Christian. So I went to this Bible study, and I was amazed and blown away at what I saw there, because I was prepared for a Bible study that was what I was used to. There was a leader. The leader would teach us, ask a few questions. We would respond with what we thought and what we believed. And so that's what I thought I was getting myself into. So I went to this Bible study, and it was different. There was a leader, but he didn't talk much. He didn't ask many questions. He would raise a topic, and then my peers, other guys that were about 21 years old, would talk about things that they had learned in Scripture. And it went something like this. There would be something brought up, and someone would say, well, yeah, you know, but in John 15, 7, it says that uh, if anyone follows me, uh, he can ask whatever he wish, and it will be given him. And then somebody else would bring up another verse related to prayer. And it wasn't like they were bringing it up and saying, well, let's see, there's somewhere in John, it says something. They were quoting it. They had memorized it and put it in their heart. And I was blown away. Because I could see that the word of God was living and active in their hearts. They had committed to it and committed to learning it and knowing it. And I decided that I wanted to be like that that night. 
that I wanted to know God and his word the way that they did. When we talk about learning and continually learning from Jesus, today we are talking about learning his word and allowing the spirit to communicate to us through the word of God. If we look at the people in scripture who followed God or followed Jesus, we have to look at how did they approach the word of God and how did they approach scripture. And we have to evaluate in some ways if our life looks like theirs. If we look at Jesus when he was tempted in Matthew 4, taken out into the wilderness and tempted, there are three temptations that the devil brings before him. And the temptations are not wild things, but he says things that are similar to what God might have said. And each time, Jesus responds, it is written, it is written, it is written. Jesus stored up the word of God in his heart. In Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7, Moses communicates about the word of God like this. These commandments today that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. We have to remember that this was a time before they had the printed word. And if they were to do this, they had to know what the word of God said to begin with. They had to know these commandments. But Moses says, impress them on your children. Talk about them. Where? Well, when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. Okay, well... When? When you lie down and when you get up. All the time. This was to be a part of who they were. Something that's motivating to me is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which says, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And verse 17 goes on, So that the man of God or the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So all scripture is from the mouth of God. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And then this last part is the part that really motivates me. So that the man of God or the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I learned that verse in college, and then I learned another verse that related to it, Ephesians 2.10, which says, For we are God's workmanship, Create in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. And so on the one hand, we have this passage in 2 Timothy that says, the word of God is useful to prepare us to do good works. And then we have this verse in Ephesians 2.10 that says that we are God's workmanship and that he has already prepared good works for us to do. And as I thought about those two and prayed over those two verses... I believe the Holy Spirit showed me that if I do not prepare to equip myself with the word of God so that I can do the good works, I will not be able to do some of the good works that God has prepared for me to do. It is essential that we continue to learn from the word of God. Finally, am I bearing fruit? The goal of following Jesus is not that we can observe what he's done. It's not that we can put things in our minds in an academic sort of way. The goal is that we apply it to our lives. And the fruit that we are to bear, principally, is fruit of our character and who we are and who we've become. Scientists have realized that as people live together over a long period of time, they begin to look like one another. And I think this is kind of unfortunate for my wife that she's going to be coming to look like me a little more, but probably good news for me. Um, But you know the other thing that's true? And this is just recent. Some Japanese scientists have taken this a step further, and they've asked the question, well, if people live with pets for a long time, do do the owner and the pet begin to to look like one another? And the surprising answer is yes, they do. And they've actually narrowed it down to figure out, well, what is it that looks alike between a pet and their owner. And they found that if they just take a swatch, a picture of like this much of a person's face and this much of the pet's face, that people that don't know the pet or the person and are given random pets and owners to match, that they can match well above 50% the pet to the owner. 
which is probably unfortunate news for all of us with pets. <laughs> the goal of following Christ is to become like him and to look like him. In Acts 11.26, it says that the, t- the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And at its surface, it's not that significant of a verse, but if we realize what Christian means, Christian literally means little Christ. And so the people in Antioch were looking at the disciples and were saying, oh, look at the little Christ running around. And they meant it as an insult. Those in Antioch were insulting the disciples. And I don't know for sure, but my guess is the disciples wore that as a badge of honor. That they could see that other people see so much of Jesus in me that they are calling me a little Jesus. Boy, I want that to be true in my life, and I'm so far from that right now. One of the things that that the Holy Spirit put his finger on in my life as I was preparing this message was actually scripture memory. Because for years, I memorized two verses a week, and then I would review those verses so I wouldn't forget the things that I'd already memorized. And then I went to be a missionary in Thailand for the past several years, and I was so focused on learning a language so I could communicate that I kind of let that part of my life slip. And since I've been back, it hasn't changed at all either. And as I looked at and thought about what it means to learn from the Word of God and to bear fruit, the Holy Spirit put his finger on that point in my life and said, Justin, you're going to go talk about this? What about this in your life? And it's uncomfortable and it's hard. But if I'm going to submit myself to following him, I have no choice but to say, okay, okay, Lord. And so that's one thing that I'm working on now. In 1 John 2, 6, it says, Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. So as we think about what are the marks of a disciple, am I following, am I learning, am I bearing fruit, are three. Here are a couple verses where we could maybe sense some other marks of a disciple. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Well, if I read that verse, I must ask myself the question, how did Jesus walk? Did he, did he walk quickly? Was he in a hurry? Did he walk slowly? Did he have a purpose to the place that he was going and go there with blinders on? Did he meander? These are questions that, as I see this verse, I have to ask myself and look in the Word of God and in, in the Gospels and ask, well, how does Jesus walk? Because if I'm going to look like him, if I'm going to say that he lives in me, I need to walk like him. And so that's another way I can find another mark of a disciple. Another verse, John 4, 34, Jesus says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me. Well, the will of God. God's the one that sent Jesus. And Jesus says that his food is to do the will of God. I'm pretty sure he didn't mean that literally because we see him eating in the Gospels. We see him eating food that we would eat. But I think what he's saying there is he hungers. He has a hunger to do what God asks him to do. And so another mark of a disciple that we're not going to talk much about is do I hunger to do the will of God? Is that something that rises up within me and that's a hunger for me in my life? A lot of times, honestly, I have to answer no. But I want to be like that. And I want to continue to follow Jesus and submit myself to him so that I am like that. Matthew 4, 19. Jesus said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Another mark of a disciple. Those that follow Jesus will fish for men. And so I have to ask myself if I am not fishing for men, and I don't mean day one, but if there is a a pattern in my life where I never fish for men, then it's a fair question for me to ask myself, am I really following? Because disciples are marked by Jesus. They must bear fruit in becoming more and more like him. A disciple continually follows, continually learns, continually bears fruit. And when we go back to the scripture that we started with this morning, how amazing is it that Jesus selected these 11 guys, ordinary, unskilled men, 
and said, the plan for my salvation of the world rests on your shoulders. Because if those 11 guys had not taken seriously what Jesus said and had not gone out and made disciples, you and I would not be in this church today. We would not know who Jesus was today. I've had some say to me about the Great Commission, well, yeah, that's for some people, but I don't really feel like it's for me. And I kind of challenge them on that, and I say, well, let's think about this, because Jesus says to those 11 guys, he says to go make disciples, teaching them everything I've commanded you, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Part of what Jesus commanded the, the 12 was to go out, to be fishers of men, to bear fruit, the things that we've been talking about. And so if those 11 guys go out and do that, then we have some more. And those guys, if they've been taught to obey, are going and doing the same thing all the way down through the generations and the years until we are here today. Paul says it like this in 2 Timothy 2, 2. And the things you have heard from me, so Paul is speaking, and the things you have heard from me, Paul, teach to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Paul says, the things you have heard from me, so Paul is talking to someone, this someone, go teach to reliable men, and these reliable men also teach others. This is the vision of disciple making. This is what Jesus is talking about, and this is the reason we're here today. This is the reason we know about Jesus, because people have been taking this seriously and doing this for thousands of years now. And now it's our turn. Now it's our turn as we sit here. And it doesn't matter what we've done up to this point. As I sat with that 62-year-old pastor this past week, it didn't matter what he'd done in the past. He's looking forward, and he is making a decision that he wants this to be a part of his life. And I can tell you there's no greater joy than seeing God work through you and through your life. And I know so many here are already doing that and seeing that. But as an encouragement, we must continue. We must continue to submit ourselves to Jesus because he is the master. And if there are points that Jesus has pointed out in our life, so for example, mine this week, if Jesus says to me, well, I want you, Justin, to work on this. If I say to him, no, I don't really think I'm going to do that. Or if I say, well, I'm going to wait. I'm not following any longer. I have said to him, I will follow you up to this point and no further. We must continually follow, continually learn, and continually bear fruit. Let's pray. Lord, allow us the grace to receive whatever you're pointing out in our lives right now. Lord, that we would not harden our hearts, we would not be dull or foolish and turn away. Lord, I pray that we would follow you and we would be so enamored by you that we would see that following you is such a privilege. Lord, we pray that we would become like you. Lord, so much so that people would see you in us. And Lord, we know that when people see you and that you are lifted up, that you draw people to yourself and lives are transformed. Lord, help us to start with ourselves that we would be a disciple, that we would continually follow, continually learn, and continually bear fruit. I pray all this in Jesus' name.